G'day guys and girls, prospectors, experimenters. Okay, um, this video is specifically going to explain modifications from the SD2000 detector uh, all the way right through to the GPZZ, Z or Z, depends where you come from. 7000. Now, I'm doing this video because uh, a lot of people ring up and uh, keep Dave on the phone for a long time and he doesn't get any work done. So, and I'm going to try and ad address a lot of the uh, questions with this video. Hopefully, um, it can allow him to do more work. <laughs> He'll direct people to this video. So hopefully it answers your questions. But let's start with the SD2000. Uh, SD2000, manual ground balance uh, detector. In standard form, it is not very good on tiny gold. So in that regard, you could have a small coil on the detector and you could walk around the trashed gold fields and never find a speck. That's just the nature of the beast. But as a modified detector, it is very good on small gold. <clears throat> and it's also very good on large gold. Actually, in its standard form, it's extremely good on large gold. And it can be made better, of course, with new modern um, updates done to the circuitry. But it also has other um, capabilities. People forget about the 2000. Uh, the circuitry inside the 2000 basically was running two channels, um, a big deep gold and ground balance channel and uh, the smaller gold channel. And the way it would actually work is it would flip between audio output to what channel had the greater signal level. And thinking back, it's a very interesting and what I would, in, in my opinion, I would call strange way of doing things, but it actually worked. And I'll, I'm going to explain a few things about it, which people may or may not know. People who had these detectors in the old days will know, but uh, people who get them now would have no idea unless you go and talk to people who had the uh, SD2000. What it would do is it would, the, the um, if I remember my channels right, channel two was for the smaller gold, channel one was the uh, larger gold and basically big ground sampling channel. And it's quite um, a width in time. I think it, uh, it's about 240 or 260 microseconds long. And the small pulses are about 60 for memory. And the newer detectors are a lot smaller than this, but we'll get into that later on. And because of this big, long pulse it puts out, if you had a very large piece of gold or metal target at depth, it has enough time duration to really um, properly energize a big huge target you would have more luck with an sd2000 and a big coil of finding something this big than probably the modern detectors and i'm talking about extreme depth um, just because of the long pulse you need a lot of energy to energize something this big you can't energize it with a very small pulse from your coil um, it just won't energize the target it will partially energize thus you get a partial return signal big long pulses then snap off and listen that um, target is basically we used to call it ringing like a bell you know if you just tap if you've got a big bell you tap it with a small hammer you're not going to get much uh, sound from it but you smack it with a sledgehammer it's going to entertain the neighborhood, right? Same thing with big targets, 
and a big amount of energy from uh, the detector or the coil energizing that target. So the SD2000 in that regard with a big coil is really good on big gold. Um, it does sacrifice performance on small gold. In its standard form, it's not going to get the, uh, targets like 0.1 of a gram unless you're using a very tiny coil. Then you'll have um, um, problems picking up bigger targets deeper because the coil just does not have uh, the aperture of um, its output to get down to those big uh, targets. So, you know, I always say horses for courses. Use the right thing for the, you know, or the right tool for the, the right result you want to get or what result you want to get. Don't just go and say, oh, use a huge coil like this and expect to get tiny gold. You're not going to do it. And, you know, you run a small coil like so, you're not going to get big gold deep. It's not going to do it. Um, everything is um, a, a bit of a match or a, a mismatch to a degree. To get the maximum depth from a coil um, with a particular detector, you really need it to match the size of the gold you're trying to find. You know, if, you, if you're using a huge coil, it's not going to find little specks. Um, it's just not going to do it. But anyway, see, I'm digressing away from what I wanted to say about the 2000. The 2000 can be made to work really good on small, tiny gold. It can be improved uh, in the way it ground balances. It can be improved in its power. Well, this detector, I've got to explain how. Uh, a few deficiencies with the uh, 2000. It has a switching power supply inside the detector and it runs continuously and it generates a lot of noise. Basically, it raises the noise floor of the detector. And if the more you raise the noise floor of the detector and you got the gold signal down here, well, guess what? It's under the noise floor. You're not going to hear it. The trick is to get the noise floor down here. Oh, there, there it is. Now it's not because the noise comes up. You, you want to have a very quiet detector in the electronics. So any signal coming through, no matter how small, how tiny the signal is, it's not lost in the noise of the internal electronics of the detector. Uh, so in that regard, the 2000 is noisy. And it's probably one of the reasons it doesn't work well on very small gold. Um, the timings are, are too big and the gaps are too big for small gold. But we can modify the um, timings on the uh, 2000 to a degree. We can, um, basically, if, if you shrink or bring in the transmit timings, because it everything is um uh, interconnected with the timings so say you get the big transmit pulse and you bring it in i don't know so you bring it into 180 microseconds okay and whatever the percentage is of 240 to 180 will also happen on the smaller pulses but the other thing it does too it also by the same percentage brings in when the receiver turns on. So it can make the detector more sensitive. So I don't know the actual figures off the top of my head of you know what moves to what, but we have sped up the um, time base in these detectors and got, got in and used uh, shielded inductors for the power supply. Um, we've put in variable gain front end. This is another thing that uh, can help in that um, 2000 putting in the variable gain front end uh, because the way it works it's a fixed gain and you can't adjust it for variations in ground mineralization uh, you know if you're working benign ground well you've got a stuck sensitivity 
And if you're working the hottest mineral gold fields in Australia or anywhere in the world, you have a stuck sensitivity. So in, uh, say you're working um, a, a small coil, uh, you've cranked up the um, frequency to be more sensitive to small gold, and you're, you're stuck on a given level of sensitivity. It, it might be um, too much for the detector, and the detector won't respond to some of the signals. It just gets lost in the noise. Um, so, you know, in some circumstances, you don't want the detector to be chattery all over the place, making up and down noises because as you go over gold the gold makes an up and down noise and if you've got all this going up and down with this mixed in it uh, this is going to obscure that so sometimes you really want to match the input sensitivity of the detector to the ground and actually that is the correct way of doing it you want to match the capability of the detector to how mineralized the ground is and if you you know, working pipe clays or ground that doesn't have a lot of mineralization, you can turn the gain up and then you're going to hear targets that everyone else walks over if they haven't uh, been over the UFA detector, they can put the gain up on. So there's benefits. The 2000, yeah, we can do a few things with the 2000. The other thing about the 2002, because you can turn on the... Uh, just basically through the audio output, you can turn on the long channel or the short channel or both. And the other thing, because it has manual ground balance on both channels, we used to offset the ground balance. And we used to put on really bad ground, we would offset it towards a negative, And that would make the ground quieter. Um, you could still hear decent sized targets, but they were easier to hear. And if you're working very benign ground, you add a positive offset. Uh, basically, it just makes the detector more sensitive. It may be more um, responsive to ground noises, but if you're in quiet ground, you shouldn't have that much of a problem. And the other thing we used to do with it as well is we used to put the detector into long pulse channel and increase the frequency of the detector and it would have an absolute benefit when you're on a salt lake uh, looking for tiny gold in a salt lake um, environment it would have such a um, a off time on the uh, big long channel that uh, a lot of the salt decay um, would disappear and still have enough oomph to energize any target at, at depth um, and uh, bringing it, also bringing it in a little bit made it more sensitive towards small gold but it's one of the best detectors to use on on salt as as an old detector it uh, actually worked so there was a um, modification that was done so that's probably all I can think about um, about the 2000. Still, when it's done up, it's a very capable detector, except it has a manual ground balance. If the ground is basically the same over a given area, it doesn't make any difference. Um, you'll usually hear it go out of balance, and then you just readjust it. So a cheap, good detector, nothing wrong for an SD2000, can be made to be really, really good. Um, the next model, 2100. There's a couple of versions of uh, the 2100s. Uh, 2100 and 2100E. I think the E might have an extra um, gain stage inside the detector uh, for memory. It might be a little bit better than a straight 2100, but if you uh, install a new input stage, new front end, which um, I do, and put in variable gain, you can overcome that uh, stage deficiency really easy uh, doesn't make any difference because most of your important electronics is always in the front end the front part the bit that receives the signal that's the important bit if, if you make a mess of that in the electronics um, what will happen is your signal gets lost in the noise so you keep a low noise floor 
and then you can uh, adjust the gain or the ground and it gives you the best possible chance of getting any type of gold, uh, be it small or big, depending on the coil you're using. You know, one coil doesn't suit all. Um, it just doesn't. It's very specific. Small, small coil for small gold, big coil for big, deep gold. So the 2100, um, yeah, we can put um, variable frequency. So that's uh, continuously adjustable. We can also um, have the ver put in variable gain, so you can match it to any conditions. Uh, and basically uh, fix up some of the older electronics inside the detector to make it more stable and quieter. Okay, um, let's go to the 2200, SD2200. Um, a very versatile detector. That has uh, the first detector, I think, that MindLab brought out. Uh, that had automatic ground balance. And for, I just remember, I used to use one and it was a damn good detector actually. You know, it's funny because I've probably had, I've had every detector that Mine Lab's ever put out, I think. Even going back to the old Gold Seekers things, the, the tin box. But uh, I won't go there. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, FT16. 16,000s, uh, FT 17,000, um, Eurekas, and all sorts of uh, detectors over the years. Uh, but yeah, the 2200, we can put variable gain on the, the 2200, we can put variable frequency on the 2200, we can also quieten up the electronics on the 2200. Very good detector, very, very sensitive on small gold actually, and can be made more sensitive on small gold also uh, capable on big gold uh, there's nothing wrong for 2200 i think they'd probably be still um you know still available on the second hand market and uh they should be um easy to get at a very good price uh I'm trying to think of any other good attributes about the 2200 uh It was just a good detector, a, a basic detector, but it was good. Uh, so that's some modifications that can be done to that. What else have we got now? Let's go to the GP Extreme. And as in my previous video, we found that uh, the early extremes came out with um, um, the NE triple, well, no, NE five five three fours in the input stage which are a noisier device <clears throat> than the later ones that had the AD797s. So depending what model it is, really hard to know. Uh, if, if it tends to be noisy in operation, it maybe it's got the uh, 5534s in it. Uh, the only one to really know is um, unsolder the ICs and have a look underneath. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to do noise measurements inside the detector. Uh, it's, it's just too much other things in there making noise. So you, you actually have to remove the ICs and have a look. Uh, I'd say that it may correspond to having the BSP-121 uh, N-channel MOSFETs um, also on the switching circuit for, you know, isolating the transmit and receive if it's got those be very wary that it might have any 5534s as the op amps on the front end and you know i don't know like 100 percent. maybe there's ones that had the bsp 121s and have ad 797s i don't know um, it depends on how they manufactured the detectors and what was happening at the time how many they made and uh, all the rest of it. But the Extreme uh, is a very, very good detector. Uh, it's not as refined as later detectors. And I mean in signal response. And because of that, it tends to be very, very sensitive. It's actually a good detector. Um, and even if it has the uh, inferior components inside the detector, 
they can be swapped out and you can put better ones in. It's also another detector we can um, put in the variable frequency and we can also um, add variable gain to it, which makes it a really, really good detector. It's, it's probably as sensitive as anything out there today. It's not a bad detector. It works good. And also with the older detectors, uh, you can use any aftermarket coil uh, from anywhere. You know, if you, if you want to get coils out of Bulgaria or Russia or Turkey, China, um, and the manufacturers here in Australia, uh, you just plug it on any of those detectors I've mentioned, and it'll work, work fine. So basically, um, the next detector along, what do we got? GP3000. The GP3000, if you have a look at a GP Extreme, if you look at the circuit board, they look identical. Uh, it's very, very close. It may have a couple of little part changes here and there. I don't know. They're all covered in white epoxy paint of some description, and it's really, really difficult to remove. Uh, if you try to, um, you know, wash all the white paint off the board and just dipped it in some sort of solvent, you'd lose all your part part numbers. It'd probably eat the plastic off the parts. I wouldn't do that. Um, it could be detrimental because that the, whatever paint they use and they've changed it over the years, uh, it's tough as. There's some of these early detectors, you know, they're about three millimeters, or you know. Basically, getting close to a you know a sixteenth to an eighth of an eighteenth, eighteenth, an eighth of an inch thick of paint, you know, or something like that, and you know you can't really get your soldering iron into it. It's horrible stuff, and uh, yeah, it makes repairing these detectors difficult uh, if you go searching to try and find the faults. But yeah, three thousand. It's a very very good detector. I still. Will have 3000s, I use 3000s. And after that, we have the uh, 3500. 3500 to me, I do have a couple. They are a refined version of the 3000. It's a very capable detector. It's a lot quieter, um, but it still works extremely well. It's fairly sensitive, but also, you can add variable frequency and variable gain into it to make it into a very adaptable detector. Um, you can improve the internal components in any of these detectors. Depends how far you want to go. You know, you, you can um, modify these detectors um, and spend a lot of money. But, you know, it depends what, you, what your end goal is. You know, you can optimise it to be you know, really, really good on big, deep gold using big coils and specifically make it that way. Uh, you can make it specifically for using smaller coils and smaller gold. And you could specifically um, put in um, the variable frequency, variable front end gain, um, upgrade some of the um, components uh, inside the detector. And uh, you make it adjustable, it'll cover all bases. It'll go from big, deep gold or tiny, tiny gold, um, fully adjustable. So after that, um, we come to the GPX 4000. The 4000 is nothing um, component-wise. Well, in operations-wise, it's very similar to the 4500 and 5000. But it's it's a high it's the design's like a hybrid between um, a three thousand type series detector and you know a, something approaching a forty five hundred. It's totally different board design, but what I found it's a very very capable detector. Uh, it does everything. Um, say. The earlier ones, like you know, your three thirty five hundred, we'll say we'll say thirty five hundred, because it is the model after. Uh, does everything that detector does? It has um, some extra timings in there. It does not have enhance or fine gold. Uh, 
I think it has just about everything else. It might be called something else, but it's a very, very capable detector. There's nothing wrong with that detector. Uh, I, I used the 4000. 4, um, yeah, I can't think of anything bad with it. Uh, it worked really well. Um, it had, had a lot of variable functions in the, in the back menu. You had a digital display. And uh, they, they did work quite well. Um, then comes along 4500 functionality, quieter. Um, the extra uh, timings in the 4500, I think you've overall, I think you've got six timings in the uh, 4500. And one of those timings, the enhanced timing, uh, is very very handy for extremely bad conditions but like I say it's really made for uh, smaller gold in bad conditions it does have a depth drop off compared to normal mode so you don't want to go looking for big deep gold with it uh, in enhanced but people do then again this detector can also be modified to have <coughs> um, full range variable gain and variable frequency components can be upgraded uh, in this detector as well and thinking back this might be the start of the detectors running the uh, series n channel devices in the input stage i'm not actually sure if the 4000 had p then um or should i say and then P. Yeah, not that it makes much difference. It's just the way the, uh, the devices are configured. Oh, I just having to think about that. I, I, I can't recall. But uh, I, may, maybe the uh, 4000 did have that new configuration. Maybe it didn't. But I know from uh, 4500 onwards it does. So, uh, so the 4500 is, it's actually, the 4500 is my detector of choice. I do know that uh, in some of the um, advertising for the 5000, it said it's quieter and so forth, <laughs> right? And, well, out of the box, it is quieter. But uh, you have to remember one thing, is that, the gain of the input stage standard of a 4500 is a gain of 48 times. So it's a multiplication. Whatever the signal gets picked up by the coil, it's multiplied 48 times. And then it's manipulated, processed, it goes through the electronics. And most of the detectors, um, all the way back to the SD. 2000 are all a gain of uh, 48 all of them it's it's just the way they were made and it must have been a reason for that over so many um, detectors so I, I do like the uh, 4500 it it, it um, I've got 5000s and I've got 40, 40 uh, 500 I had a 4800 um, it was sort of um, an odd odd beast. It was much the same. Uh, it, it just, I think it was missing in hands. I'm not sure, but it was missing something. I remember that. But the 4500 uh, is a detector that I've got most of my gold with, uh, except for the early days when gold was really easy to find. And I found most of my gold, not with mine lab detectors, but with Garrett detectors and White's detectors, um, you know, gold was really easy to find. You can go to the gold field back in the eighties, and you would you would find gold fairly quickly. And the gold was bigger because it was easier to find. Now everyone's nitpicked it, and the gold's getting smaller and smaller. So you have to have a lean towards getting the smaller gold, but you still don't want to sacrifice the depth capability. At the same time, because you know you, you can't say every square 
metre or every square foot of the ground has been detected. It hasn't. Um, people of my own observations, I've, I've looked at people when they go detecting and if you have 10 people go into an area from a common point, they're like goats. <laughs> Not like goats, really, but they behave the same way, is that they tend to follow the same path. If you've got an area, uh, say a grassed area over here, the grass is high, and a low area here is no grass, um, and it's just basically open, very easy to detect. They'll all go to the easy to detect area, right? Uh, they won't walk through any, uh, you know, low hanging branches and things like that. They, they'll avoid it. They'll go around it, and you know that you, you got to get into the mindset of going into the difficult area. You don't go where they've gone. It's all been, you know, like 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 a herd of goats has gone through there. You go. You know, people have a natural tendency to sort of, I don't know why, but they sort of do, instead they go into a gold field, they do a right-hand turn, uh, right, and start walking toward the, to the right. I've noticed this. And so do a left, go left. Um, the best one ever, um, this is um, at a place called Longbush. See, I'm getting off the detectors, but I'm just going to say this because it's very interesting. Um, there's a fellow I used to go detecting with, and he used to park in the same spot all the time. Every time we went to Longbush, park in the same spot. And one day we went to Longbush. There's a lot of gold coming out of Longbush, by the way. Anyway, one day we went to go to Longbush, and there was someone in, in the car parking spot. Well, it's not really. It's, just, it's a really good area between trees on the side of the road. And there's nowhere really to park. It's it's too um, treed and so forth. So we had to go right up and got into an area and we parked there. We'd gone in detecting. And uh, this fellow um, has worked all the way back to where, roughly to where we parked the car. Well, where we used to. And whoever was there had gone. And he went and detected where that was parked and pulled a three ounce nugget. He'd been parking over it for years. So, <laughs> like I say, it's just amazing. Another time where I got a, um, a decent size piece of gold as well from an area, I was not getting any, any signals whatsoever, but I poked my coil under a bush. And this was with a 2200. And I had uh, it on discriminate. I poked it under the bush, and it made a staccato type of sound. So I said, oh, it's ferrous junk. So I've gone detecting around the place, probably about an hour and a half. No, there's no targets, nothing. So this was, um, I was told to go there by someone I knew. And uh, anyway, I don't know if I got into the wrong spot or whatever, but there's no, there's no gold, there's nothing. So I went back to where I got that uh, noise. And because of a, another guy I know who um, had a similar thing happen, he um, got a noise and he pulled out the framework of an old strong box that was a wooden box but had all the metal um, flat banding ar around it where it was just a, a frame. But he pulled that out from under bushes as well. So I had this thing that made a staccato. I thought, oh, maybe it's something like that. So I, I threw the pick in there and I pulled it out. And uh, it wasn't uh, ferrous metal. It was gold. It was 13 ounces. But because it was so big, it was overloading the coil, overloading the detector, and making it give a ferrous sound. So it's the only piece of gold in the area. I don't know if it was um, been put there, um, it was a natural occurrence, or whatever. Um, you know, I'm, when I say put there, maybe from the 1800s, people used to do that uh, if they were working in a party. They would find a big piece of gold and stick it somewhere and forget where they put it. That's very common. Uh, down down mullock heaps as well. They would uh, see a big piece of gold and uh, they'd throw it into um, the um, skip bucket 
and uh, hide it, and they would uh, push it off in a particular direction and think about where it went and say, I'll come back tonight and get that, and they couldn't find it, right? <laughs> End up getting buried. So that's another common occurrence, um, nuggets in mullock heaps. So don't go pulling mullock heaps apart. Some of them you're not allowed to anymore. Yeah, okay. So that's a little bit of a side story there. Well, let's get on to the 5,000. 5,000 uh, has got the extra, um, it's got a couple of extra modes on it, but uh, the mode which is very good for very nasty ground is fine gold. The 45 doesn't have it, but the 5,000 does. The 5,000 also has less front end gain. It has a front end gain of 34. You might not think it's much difference um, going from 48 to 34. Yes, it, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it makes a difference. Uh, this is by side by side testing on uh, test sites. The by having less gain, it's a way of making the detector more overly quiet. And it was marketed as a quieter detector. And it be careful what I say here. Okay, I'll cover it easy. My opinion, because I used it, uh, it wasn't as good on Big Deep Gold, I'll tell you that. Um, it just wouldn't give the signal response because of the lack of gain in the detector. In the front end of the detector you could you could crank it up in the back end but it just wouldn't overcome the front end gain loss you really want the gain in the front end but you don't want so much gain that it saturates the electronics so the 5000 is an absolute brilliant contender for variable front end gain not the standard gain you adjust on the back panel that works further back in the detector it does not have anything to do with adjusting the gain in the front end part of the detector. So um, a 5000, in that regard, is a really good detector to um, add variable frequency and front end gain. Uh, also, you can change the components to better spec components. Same as the other detectors. Make it a better detector. Make it more quiet but still punchy. Uh, I'm just deep in thought um, about it and what I can say is that um, in Victoria which we've got pretty nasty gold fields here I have never got into a situation with um, really bad ground that I couldn't work um, in Enhance. Enhance would, would um, cover it in nearly every, well, actually, in every instance. I've never been in a situation where I would say, oh, I wish I had that 5,000 and I could use uh, fine gold. Um, maybe in some places in WA, there may be um, somewhere where you'd want to use the fine gold mode. But, you know, if I'm poking around rocks, looking for small gold, looking for, um, you know, little little runners and, uh, you know, species and stuff like that, I'd use enhance, um, you know, in, in a noisy environment. that That's just me. That's my opinion on the subject. Uh, so with um, fine gold, I think... Think there's a bit of a depth loss again and you know if you don't need it and you're getting a depth loss i'd say why would you use it but it is a very very interesting mode to use and i suppose it has got its uses but i i just never had to um use fine gold uh on the later detectors like uh, even the gold monster. Um, I had the gold monster here. I went out with the gold monster. Um, for a beginner, what a what a 
good detector for a beginner. Turn it on, and away you go. Uh, it works. It's sensitive, sensitive enough. Um, you know, it's not going to pull pull big nuggets out down one point two meters, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's a it's a good little uh, detector. Nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, th what's it? there's another one too. There's a whole um, there's some old cheapo thing. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, it, because it was really really cheap, I didn't worry ever looking at it or or getting hold of one to to test it because I know it just probably wouldn't perform. And uh, you know, then then I had the um, seven thousand. I had a seven thousand for a while. I had the other two seven thousands as well, which I upgraded for some uh, people um, just as test units, and they are very happy with um, the upgrades on the seven thousand. Uh, they they uh, said there was an improvement. You can read the comments on the seven thousands on the videos. Um, the thing I don't like about uh, the seven thousand it weighs a ton. Well, not a ton, but it's damn heavy. And you know when it first came out as a limitation in coils, uh, the fourteen the fourteen coil fourteen inch coil works better than the nineteen in my opinion. Uh, I, I can't see why, what the benefit is with the 19 over the 14. I really can't. You start losing um, uh, capability, some capability on small gold. Not not much, but you you will. And yeah, I could I I did some tests at uh, Talbot test site. And the the 14 was giving better responses. Oops, I just kicked the camera. Uh, the 14 was giving better responses on targets. Um, up to the size of a crushed Coke can. So work that one out. Uh, you've got all these other coils coming from overseas. You've got all these, uh, you know, the Russian X coils. <clears throat> you know, is there a performance benefit from those coils? I don't know. I've never used one. But I know people blow up their detectors trying to put the dongle chip in to that coil. Uh, so you should leave that to someone who knows what they're doing. To do that, um, yeah, it's a very expensive mistake to make. So, well, what I what I did is take the dongle out of the connector, and I actually stuck it inside the detector, so it's there forever, and you can use non non dongled coils from then on. Um, you know, if that's with the seven thousand, it will just turn on, and uh, as long as it has a coil connected, doesn't have to be a dongle coil. Um, it just goes. You know, handshake, handshake, yeah, I'll turn on, away it goes. So then you can muck around using different sorts of coils and not have to worry about having, um, you know, being locked out by having to have this handshake um, thing. Uh, then you've got um, the uh, 6000, and that's that's different again. I think uh, the handshake's inside the coil, not not in the plug. Which makes life difficult unless you want to uh, cut it out of the coil, and you can then mount that inside the detector, and then you can run any damn coil you want on it <laughs> again because it's going to handshake inside the detector. But you've got to cut your coil open to get your hands on it in the first place. I don't know if you want to do that. Um, that's that's a big ask because um, these things they're coded. It's probably use, utilizing a rolling code and it, it won't be um, possible for, you know, our favourite people north of Australia to crack that. So um, you'll probably never see uh, any uh, Chinese or Bulgarian or Turkish or Russian calls for it. Um, it probably will never happen for that detector. And you have to um, either buy a genuine mine lab or... Um, I think Nugget Finder and Cortec uh, have access to getting hold of those uh, chips and putting it in their coils. So I think uh, they must have a arrangement with MineLab where they can do that. But again, um, it's a it's another limitation on the coil you can use. You're sort of um, forced into a position to using dongled 
we call them dongles. It's, it's a it's a word we used in the 1980s. We used to have software, and you had to plug something in the parallel, a little um, EEPROM or a little um, micro coded or something of that nature back then. We had to plug it in the old computer, and the software would talk to it and do a handshake with that, and then the software was usable. If you didn't have the dongle, the software wouldn't work, and you know. It used to drive everyone crazy. It stopped counterfeiting software. If you didn't have this, that wouldn't work. And that, that's what actually um, um, gave a massive rise in um, um, hackers cracking the software, finding out the uh, internal algorithms of the code, what it was looking for, and then coding it in and uh, crack the software. You didn't need the dongle anymore, and there's all these counterfeits out there. Um, but thank God the dongles are gone. Now a lot of stuff is, uh, you know, what they call SAAS. And, uh, you know, it, it has to go online and talk to the website that you paid money and registered your software with or else your software is not going to work. So, you know, I've got old, old programs uh, of various things that, uh, you know, it is a standalone working thing. So... You know, even free versions of particular software that uh, for, say, um, circuit board design and that, um, it just runs off your, uh, on your computer. It's limited in what it can do, but, you know, you've got editors in there. You can make your own component footprints and things and make your own PCBs and, you know, send it off to China and the board comes back. Uh, you know, software, if you want a, the new software to do that, God, you know, damn expensive, thousands of dollars. And a lot of it is pay per month or pay per year. You know, you've got to keep paying. Even if you're not designing anything, you're still paying. Um, I don't see the point. I don't like it. So I keep old software. Um, get around that sort of business. There's no, there's no need for me to actually go and buy you know, expensive software packages um, to design stuff. No point. Okay. So I think I've covered all the detectors um, with what you can do and what they're capable of. But for a deeper gold machine, stock standard off the, uh, off the shelf, between a 45 and a 5,000. This is the biggest question we get. If you've got a stock standard one, well, it's it's really it gets hard. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because the f first forty five hundreds came out, and they have a gain of forty eight. And somewhere through the series of the forty five hundreds, they reverted to a gain of thirty four. So it's the same gain as the five thousand, and you know. Maybe it's exactly the same circuit board with different software. There are, there are differences between the early 4500s and the later 4500s. If you get a later 4500, the board looks identical, um, you know, just by visuals through the paint. Looks looks like the 5000. But uh, if you look at uh, the original 45, and the 5000 or the newer 45, which is probably out of production now anyway, um, yeah, there is differences in the uh, components. There's, there's extra components on the, uh, the later 45s and 5000s. I don't know where the serial numbers stop and start on those detectors, so it's very difficult to know which one is which. I don't even know if it was called a Series 2 or a Series 1. I don't know. Um, but I, did, I have had both detectors come in for upgrades and I have to do it in a little bit of a different way, depending. I can easily tell which one's which because the circuit board's different. So, you know, I hope that ex has explained the differences through those series of detectors. Uh, you know... I didn't really go into much detail on the GPX 6000. Uh, like I say, I've, 
I only used it with the mono coil. I did not use it with a double D, so I can't even say anything about that. Uh, the one the one I did have, it did have the microphonics issue. I cured that and uh, um, and it was not as sensitive and it was not as quiet as my own modified 4500. I, I ran side by side. I did it close to the city and I did it further afield. And you can have a look at the videos too on the, those detectors that the um, 6000 was more noisy and Given the same diameter coil, uh, the 4500 was quieter and, in my opinion, gave a better, a much clearer signal response. But, you know, then again, I did not run out into a terrible, nasty gold field with it um, and give it a, you know, a good go over. I was doing it in moderately mineralized ground with lots of quartz through it so that's that uh, but you know that's probably as far as I can push giving information on these detectors because you know otherwise it's all too nitty-gritty and it's just rambling it's bad enough anyway trying to explain all this in one hit so uh, yeah I hope that um, answers a few questions for people so Dave will be happy he'll be able to refer people to this video and uh, it may confuse them even more and they'll ring him up and pester him I don't know but anyway that's that guys so uh, yep I'll um, turn this off if you've got any questions ask just put it in the comments because then I can handle it very quickly and uh, yeah things should uh, work out catches